Hey, uh, thank you, band, production, all that stuff, man. So, so good. That song is what we're going to do in this journey, is we are going to take a hard, long look in the mirror. Because in our culture, in our world, and just in our selfishness, what we like to do is we like to point fingers and uh, post about somebody else or something else, blame others. That's not what we're going to do in this journey. We're going to look in the mirror. We're also going to have some fun in case you haven't realized, but we're gonna challenge ourselves in the course of this six-week journey because we believe when our vulnerability collides with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that results in true community. And I best saw this illustrated several years ago in a story that gripped me, that got hold of me, and would not let go. So I want to start this journey by telling you a little story, taking you on a trip to set up our journey. Let's play a word association game. You know what that is, right? It's where I say a word and you say whatever comes to mind. So if you hear the word football, you may say Tom Brady or Super Bowl or soccer. What do you think of when you hear this word? Church. If you're like a lot of people, you may say things like irrelevant, judgmental, hypocrites, fake. What's interesting is when you read the scriptures, when you look at the gospels, that's nothing that describes what Jesus was like. When you read the book of Acts in the Bible, that doesn't describe what the early church was defined by. The early church was defined by things like power and community, vulnerability, it was both safe and dangerous. It was safe for the broken, but it was dangerous because it was on a powerful mission. What has the church today lost that has made it something that was never designed to be? I believe the answer. is found in a church that was built 900 years ago that lived out a unique mission on D-Day. So it went on the beaches of Normandy this fateful day in June. Reinforcements continued to pour ashore. Artillery and heavy engineering equipment were firmly established. The German boast that an invading force could not remain... June 6, 1944, D-Day. The 101st Airborne, known as the tip of the spear, is dropped into northern France to begin the fight against Hitler and the Nazis. Two medics, are among the 101st, Kenneth Moore and Robert Wright. Like most of the 101st, they were misdropped. Like many of their other soldiers, they lost their supplies in the drop, but very quickly fighting breaks out. One of them says, there's no substitute for hearing a bullet whiz by your ear knowing someone's trying to kill you. Eventually, Robert Wright, in seeking a place where he can treat wounded, comes upon a 900-year-old church, this church, and he decides this is the perfect place where I can gather the wounded who've been shot or injured in other ways and treat them to help them. At the same time, Kenneth Moore begins to find injured soldiers and eventually sees this church, and he knows it's a makeshift aid station because upon arrival, Robert Wright took a cross flag with the red cross on it affixed it to the door and began to go to work. Kenneth Moore would take an old wheelbarrow he found and go find a soldier who was injured, wheel him in, leave him on one of these pews and go out looking for more. The night is anything but uneventful. 
At one point, a dud bomb drops through the ceiling. Everyone freezes. It doesn't go off. Creates a crack in the stone floor and they throw it outside just in case. At one point, a German soldier bursts through the doors holding a machine gun. But when he makes eye contact with one of the medics, they maintain a gaze for several seconds. Then he lowers his machine gun. He crosses himself and walks out the door. And yet another time, some German officers come in the front door when they communicate and understand what is going on and see that the medics are treating both German and American soldiers without discrimination among uniform. The officers promise to send a doctor as soon as they can. Over the course of 36 hours, Moore and Wright treat 80 soldiers in this church. Only two soldiers under their care lost their lives that night. Eventually the fighting moves on, so Moore and Wright move on themselves. They're each awarded a silver star for what happened in this church so many years ago, and they go on to serve in the rest of the war. But what's striking to me is not just that amazing story, but it's what happened after the war. After World War II was over and the people of Angoville were rebuilding both their lives and this church building, they fixed the stained glass that had been shot out. They repaired the hole in the roof through which the dud bomb had fallen. But when they looked at the pews, they saw many of them covered with blood. I mean, these pews are where soldiers lay as they were being worked on. They had been shot, they had been injured, so they were bleeding. And the villagers did something that is quite striking because they didn't replace the pews, they didn't sand them down and varnish over them or something like that. They left them with the blood on it. They said this church was constructed 900 years ago to be a place of hope and healing for the broken and hurting. And on D-Day, they said that's what it was. So we will preserve the church of the bloodstained pews. We will preserve the bloodstained pews themselves as a memorial to everything that happened on that fateful day. And here's what I wonder. I wonder if the image of the bloodstained pews is exactly what is possible when the church gets it right. Is it possible that what happened in these very pews is maybe the barrier between you experiencing the community you long for and not? Is it possible that the foundation this church was built hundreds of years ago, that foundation being the gospel, the truth that Jesus died and rose again for the forgiveness of sins to give grace to all whoever would come after him to seek it? Is it possible that if we embrace this kind of vulnerability, Is it possible that if we build our churches on a vulnerability like this, where it is safe to bleed, where we can be open about our brokenness, where we can bring our dreams, our desires, and our darkness, that the church will be the irresistible community that Jesus had in mind? I believe it is, and that's why we're on this journey. So I believe this journey has the potential to change your life. On a trip, you go somewhere different. On a journey, you become someone different. And I believe you wouldn't be here if you are satisfied with the status quo in your life. I know you want God to make you into someone different. So this journey has three different components to it. One is Sunday morning worship experience. The second is the book. And the third is our journey groups. And if you do any one of them, you will grow. It is not too late to sign up for one of those journey groups. But if you really want the most out of this journey, engage in all three. 
We have a great curriculum for the groups that the team has designed and lots of leaders and availability for that. If you go to mosaicchristian.org slash groups, our team has worked really hard on this series, I think harder than any series they've ever done, so you're not going to want to miss a single Sunday during this journey. And I do want to let you know that the message series in this is not going to be just me preaching the chapters of the book, because I'm assuming you're going to go read the book, and we're not going to duplicate that. The book stands by itself. We don't have to do that. What I want to do in this series is really a six-week application of the message of the book. The book is about being real. So for these six weeks, weeks, we're going to take a different topic every week and talk about how can we be real in an area of life that maybe we're not real enough in, in an area that culture doesn't encourage us to be real, but in which if we are real, we will find freedom in Christ. When you think about it, there's lots of uh, things or, or, or areas that people really care if something's real or fake, right? Like you've heard of real diamonds and fake diamonds. There's real Louis Vuittons and fake Louis Vuittons. There's fake UFO videos and real, I hope, <laughs> UFO videos, right? There's fake news, fake shoes, fake prescription drugs, fake AirPods. And it would stink to buy some fake Air Jordans on eBay and get ripped off. But what is worse is fake people, right? I see the heads nodding. We all want something real when it comes to people. We want real friendships. We want real family. We want real marriage. We just want real. But go back to the band's song. It starts with us. If I'm not real, I can't have a real friendship because I'm the barrier. It starts by looking in the mirror and deciding to be real, deciding to be authentic, deciding to be vulnerable. So the subject we're going to talk about today is I want us to be real about family. Family is an inescapable thing that affects you in deep ways. I saw a crazy stat the other day. This is from the U.S. Census Bureau. It talked about um, how important things are. Can we go ahead and put that up? It talked about how important things are to young adults. And it talked about like, you know, getting a degree or something is 62% of people care about that. Um, find, you know, financially independent, 50%. No longer living in your parents' basement is only important to 26% of people. I don't know if they're lazy or wise, like trying to say, I don't know. Um, but here's the one that jumped out at me, is getting married is only important to 12% of young people. And when I saw that, I got sad because the family is the foundation of society. If you study history, when a society crumbles, it starts with the first domino of the family crumbling. But here is my thought. You know, you could look at that bottom stat and say, man, young people are just too selfish. And maybe that's true. But what I think is more likely is they've looked at the destruction that has been caused by the families they were raised in, at the pain that their families caused them, and they said, if that's what family is, count me out. I don't wanna have anything to do with it. And you know what? If that's the reason, I can't blame them. But here's the reality. Even if you don't wanna get married, you can't escape the need for family and the effect of family. So we're gonna turn the Bible for help. I wanna look today at a story in the Old Testament about uh, the old king of Israel, David, that happened 3,000 years ago, and his son, Absalom. It is, if you don't know the story, even if you do know it, it is completely crazy. It is jacked up, but I think we need to learn from it. Here's how the story starts, is with David's daughter, Tamar. And he has a daughter, Tamar, and her brother, Absalom, but then they have a half-brother, uh, another son of David's, named Amnon. And the story is completely jacked up because Amnon falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. He knows he can't have his half-sister, so it gets so dark, he becomes so obsessed, he rapes her. And the narrative of that part concludes with this uh, tragic line, his love was turned to hate and he hated her more than he loved her, because rape is never about love. But then Absalom, remember Tamar's brother, finds out, here's what it says, her brother Absalom saw her and asked, is it true that Amnon's been with you? 
My sister, keep quiet for now since he's your brother. Don't worry about it. And when he says don't worry about it, he doesn't mean this isn't a big deal. He means, sis, I'm going to take care of it. Don't you worry. It says, so Tamar lived as a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. But then look at this. When King David heard about what happened, he was very angry, and that's it. Like I put into the verse right there because he was angry, but nothing else happens. Like he's the king, he can bring justice, he can do whatever he wants, but he does nothing. And even us today, 3,000 years later, we don't even know Tamar. We don't even know what culture or the exact circumstance was like. But we're like, he raped his half-sister, you got to do something. We want to do more than get angry. David doesn't. So you got a son, he rapes his half-sister, under David's watch, nothing happens. Two years pass. So Absalom decides, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. We got this king who's going to sit on his hands. He does nothing. So Absalom, because Amnon had raped Tamar, Absalom murders his half-brother Amnon. Tamar is absolutely tormented. She lives with Absalom. Absalom sees this every day. He says, if my dad, if the king, the only one who can bring justice isn't going to do it, I'll take justice into my own hands. And, you know, as jacked up as that is, there's part of us that says, well, I kind of don't blame you, Right? But then King David hears about it. Aren't you glad you came to church today for this happy story? Just full of the joy of the Lord. And David mourned many days for his son Amnon. Understandable. Absalom fled to his grandfather for three years. And King David now reconciled to Amnon's death, meaning he was just at peace with it and over that initial grieving stage, longed to be reunited with his son Absalom. So again, you see David being passive. Because you know what he does here? He longs to be reunited to Absalom. You know what he does about it? Nothing. Nothing. He wanted his relationship back. He wanted to be with Absalom. He lost one son. He doesn't want to lose two, but he does nothing. So if you're somebody who goes through the Mosaic Sermon archives on whatever podcasting platform you use, you know I've preached on this a story before in a man series we did where we said a man is called to provide and protect for those under his care. And David does the opposite of that in this story. David is passive. So if you fast forward, David and Absalom are estranged. Absalom even comes back to live in the same city, Jerusalem, but they don't see each other for four years. Four years. Don't see dad and son once. So finally, Absalom gets the message. He said, Dad's a wuss. He doesn't care about me because he won't even let me come into his presence. Apparently, he was okay with his son raping my sister because he didn't do anything about it. Our country, Absalom says, our country needs a new king. So Absalom starts a coup. He runs David out of town. He uh, He takes over as king. And then, just to rub salt in the wound and to show everybody who's really in charge now, he takes every woman who had served in his father David's palace. He brings them up one by one on the roof of the palace and has sex with them in sight of the whole town where everybody can see, just so he can say, guess who's in charge now? An entire civil war breaks out. Eventually, in the civil war, Absalom is killed. So their forces are defeated. David is reinstated as king, and he enters these, uh, utters these famous words um, that have been quoted in many different ways in literature and song. The king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway and burst into tears. As he went, he cried, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Now, what's so striking about this is David did nothing to pursue a relationship with Absalom to fix what was broken in his own family. But it pierces his heart when he finds out Absalom is dead. So just to recap, this crazy jacked up story. Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar. David does nothing. So Absalom kills Amnon. Then These two guys are estranged. David does nothing to pursue him. He starts civil war. He's killed, and David is heartbroken that his son Absalom is dead. Here's lesson number one today. You should feel a lot better about your family. (laughs) Like, sometimes you read the Bible just to think, it could be worse. I could be more jacked up than I already am. 
But we need to look in the mirror here. That's what we're going to do today. And, and the thing that this story and, and, and the song and the illustration of the mirror um, makes me think of is this old legend that circulated when I was growing up. I, I don't know if you were aware of this legend, if they had it in the state or city you grew up in. Um, could be a Kentucky thing. But when I was in elementary school, this legend circulated our school every year about maybe fourth grade about this person named Bloody Mary. And what would happen is some student would pull you aside in the bathroom and say, do you know the legend of Bloody Mary? And you would hear them discussing in whispers, and you would say, I don't know about that. What are you talking about? And they would explain that if in the dead of night you went into a dark, completely dark room with a candle lit and looked into a mirror and 13 times said the name of Bloody Mary, she would appear in the mirror. Now, first of all, here's Bloody Mary. Don't know that would freak me out too much. But second of all, in researching the story to make sure I had the facts right, because I was so long ago when I heard this, heard this rumor in the bathroom of elementary school, um, I actually stumbled across the study that uh, uh, this article that a PhD who studies neuro something had discovered that if any human stares in a mirror long enough, eventually your brain will become tripped because it doesn't really understand what's going on in a mirror and your brain will become convinced someone else is staring back at you in the mirror. So if you've ever been spooked out, it wasn't a ghost, it was just you. <laughs> but I will admit, this messed me up so much that even today, if I have to get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and I walk like this by the mirror, I'm like, I'm not looking. <laughs> I'm going to do my business, I'm going to walk out with my eyes closed, bump into the counter, I don't care, I'm not going to see her, right? But we have to look in the mirror to acknowledge my family is messed up. Your family is messed up. And here's how I know you know that. Because you believe in sin. And I don't know if you believe in God, I don't know if you follow Jesus, but I know you believe in sin. And here's how I know that, because you use this phrase occasionally, sometimes in some circumstance. You say this phrase, you ought, or he ought, she ought, they ought not. Russia ought not, my boss ought to not, that politician ought to, my neighbor ought to fill in the blank. As soon as you say that, you are saying, there is a standard, and I know it, and they know it, and everybody should follow it. And that's only true if something like sin exists in this world. You believe, I know you do, there is a standard that every leader, every group, every country should follow. And when you look at your family, the people in your own home, the people you grew up with, and say, they ought to do this, or they ought not to do that, you're saying you believe in sin. And I know some of those are preference, right? Like they ought not to hate Chick-fil-A. They're weird and jacked up. That's how dysfunctional my family is. True story, right? But there are deeper things. There are character things. There are, there are right and wrong things that you say that phrase about. And all it does is you pointing out the truth of Scripture that God created a good world, but sin infected it. Sin is simply us knowing what we ought to do and not doing it. And sin impacts everything. In our story, David didn't deal with the sin that was going on. He thought if he ignored it, it would go away, I guess. But it never goes away. Almost without exception, the sin in your family affects you more than any other sin. I want to show you some scripture verses just to show you a few different ways that sin can affect you. Proverbs 22 says this, and Proverbs is just different sayings about life that are generally in true, uh, generally true about the way the world works. It says, train a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Some of you made horrible mistakes growing up because you weren't raised to know God in your family. Look at Deuteronomy 5, sin is passed down to the third and fourth generation. I used to think that was some kind of mystical curse that God like zapped people with like, oh, you're screwed, you're dead sin, third and fourth generation. Anymore as I study social science, I just believe it's God saying, here's the natural consequence. Because you know what we know about this verse? Is that if your parents are alcoholics, you're more likely to be an alcoholic. If, if your parents divorce, you're 91% more likely to get divorced. Uh, 
The scriptures say, fathers, do not exasperate your children. The biggest way that happens is in fathers abandoning their kids. And you've heard the stats. A daughter who does not grow up with a father is more likely to, by the time, she gradua- by the time she's 18, to not graduate high school, end up pregnant, end up in prison, end up addicted to drugs. Colossians 3.20 Children, obey parents in everything. The reason some of you have such a hard time obeying God is because you weren't raised in a home that you were taught obedience to your parents. Parents have two primary goals with their kids, is to teach kids, I love you no matter what, and you must obey me no matter what, so that as the kids age and become young adults and mature to live on their own, they transfer those beliefs that they had towards their parents towards God, and they understand, I must obey God no matter what, and God loves me no matter what. See, if you don't, Grow up with scripture, if your family violates scripture, it just gets permeated with sin. So here's the myth I wanna share with you. If you're taking notes today, please take a picture of this. If you're not taking notes today, please take a picture of this. Here's the myth. Someone else should deal with it. See, I think the reason David tried ignoring what was going on, the family drama, is because if you read the whole of what was going on, the story right before what we read is when David was caught having an affair and he murdered the woman's husband so he could have her to himself. And I'm speculating just a little bit, but I bet the thought that went through David's head as the, uh, the son and the rape and the murder and all the things was, well, who am I to judge? I mean, other people, because I just got caught doing this. And you know what? We all have our reasons why we should tap out on our family. Here's what I mean. David probably thought, well, Absalom should initiate because he's the one who murdered his half-brother. Absalom probably thought David should initiate. He's the king after all. The adult thinks, my mom should initiate. She's the one who abused me. Meanwhile, the mom's probably thinking, well, the child should initiate because I don't want to bring up painful memories if she doesn't want to. The husband thinks my wife should initiate fighting for this. She's the one who cheated. Meanwhile, the wife's thinking my husband should initiate because he's not going to believe anything I say anyway. The teenager thinks dad should initiate because he's the adult in the family. The dad thinks the teenager should initiate. They're the one who is offended. My point is simply this. Everybody feels wronged. So if there is going to be reconciliation, if there's going to be a healthy, renewed relationship, you have to initiate. And by you, I mean you. And I get it. They messed up. They manipulated. They were the addict. They let you down. They need to go first. I get it. But think about this. Aren't you glad that Jesus took the first step with you? Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't say, well, they should initiate. I mean, once they, once they say they're sorry, then I'll die on the cross for them. But until then, you know, I, we'll just see how things go. But he didn't. He pursued you. Sin affects your family. It causes real problems, and you have to deal with it. If I can bring in culture, this is what uh, people miss about the epic saga called Star Wars. Okay, I know there's vicious debates about episodes one through three versus episodes four through six versus episodes seven through crap. But (laughs) I have a life goal of not seeing episode seven, so far so good. Uh, Which, by the way, I was late jumping on the Mandalorian train. Hello, totally awesome. Some of y'all didn't tell me that soon enough. I'm still mad at you. But when people debate... Like these different trilogies, like here's how one through three compares to four through six, and here's how seven through nine compares to them, Um, which I'm just going to go on and say it with, if you take Jar Jar out, I think one through three is half decent, half, okay, just half decent, thank you, I hear you. Where was I? Sermon, family, Star Wars. Okay, here's why it's so important. Here's why it's captured culture for, what is it, 50 years now? It's, it, it, it is laser swords and this mysterious force and space battles and all those things are awesome. But what it's really about is the broken relationship of a father and a son and a son trying to find his place in the universe. And he realizes the only thing he needs to be fulfilled is a relationship with his father. So he fights for his father and he does whatever it takes to stare down evil. But he says evil will not overcome our family. And he succeeds and he has his father's blessing and his father's love and his father's acceptance. And people think it's about the force and lightsabers and it's not. It's about fighting for the relationships that are closest to you and that you can't do life without And that's why we love it, because it speaks to something deep in your soul. (laughs) 
Family relationships matter to you. So fight for them. They impact you for better and worse. You've got to face what's in front of you. I graduated high school in 2003, got married at 18. Life was what I expected. I was running after youth ministry. Um, we were both working full time. We kind of wound up in a spot where we weren't running in opposite directions, but we wound up in a spot where we had different friend groups. We had different crowds that we hung out with. We had different things going on. And I remember getting home one day and her telling me that she had looked at porn, which was just so outside of the norm. I mean, it, she had never done it. We, we had never done it. But I asked a lot of questions. I tried to understand. It still didn't make sense. But it definitely was a sign of like things are going wrong. We got in a big argument. She went away. She said, I need to get away for a weekend. I'm gonna go hang out with a friend of ours. And I was like, okay, great. Uh, that sounds healthy. I think that person's gonna encourage our marriage. Eventually, she shows up, walks in the door, and you know, I'm like, where were you? And she's like, oh, I was hanging out with Jimmy, who was a friend of ours. And, and I just remember her saying, like, I made out with him today. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I, like, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I'm like, we gotta work on this. We gotta figure some things out. We need to go to counseling, but I'm not gonna compete with him. Um, so his number's going out of your phone. You need to tell him you guys are done and you're done having conversations. And uh, she was agreeing to that. She was open to that. Um, but literally in the middle of that conversation, I remember the phone rang and it was him. And she said, I'm gonna take this. And I just had a sinking feeling in my gut of like, if she takes that call, I'm losing. And she took the call and walked out of the house and 20 minutes later came back. And I just remember saying, uh, hey, I'm willing to work on us, but I'm not gonna cut him out of my life. He doesn't think that's a good idea. If it makes any sense, all I felt was helpless and hopeless. Uh, it was a place I escaped to porn. It was a place I ran away from my problems. It was a place that I pretended life didn't exist, but it was just a depressing, dark place where I didn't feel like I was enough for anything. Uh, I had a couple people told me I need to meet Carl. I met Carl. Carl and I met a couple times and kind of at the end of our meeting, I said, hey, have I ever told you that I'm divorced? And uh, he said, no, but I want to hear the story. I told him the story. I told him the story of playing a game and watching another guy take my wife out on a date and feeling like I couldn't do anything. Um, I told him the story of the first birthday alone. And at one point, he just starts reaching across the table and he's punching me on the arm. Like, I remember him hitting me harder than I expected on my arm. And uh, he's like, that's why you do ministry. You do church, you do ministry because you know what it is to be hurting and broken and helpless and you, you never let that go. Uh, so now I live life with my brokenness out there. I tell the story. Um, I embrace the brokenness I still feel. Life is definitely not perfect. I still battle whether I'm man enough. I still wonder if I'm good enough. Uh, I still look in the mirror and don't know who I am at times. I'm married again, I've got three kids, uh, but let things, go off, let things go off the rails a little bit and I start to wonder why in the world I'm doing what I'm doing and if, if I'm cut out for it. But what I know through this place and through the conversations I have with the, the team that is here and the people that are part of Mosaic is that God can use my brokenness and God can redeem my pain and that God can use me because he uses broken people. Ryan, thanks for sharing your story. I know you've experienced real pain and uh, you've handled it well. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, you have to be real, like Ryan, about the pain in your family and choose to deal with it. I want to I close today uh, with uh, something we did at our men's and women's retreats a couple years ago. I want to read you a kid's story. Because I think it applies to what we're talking about. It's called, There's No Such Thing as a Dragon. And here's how it goes. Billy Bixby was rather surprised when he woke up one morning and found a dragon in his room. It was a small dragon about the size of a kitten. The dragon wag wagged its, happy, its tail happily when Billy patted it on its head. And dragons are 
mysterious creatures. We think they're mythological, but they're dangerous. But this one also seems cute and cuddly. Billy went downstairs to tell his mother, there's no such thing as a dragon, said Billy's mother, and she said it like she meant it. Billy went back to his room and began to dress. The dragon came close to Billy and wagged its tail. But Billy didn't pat it. If there's no such thing as something, it's silly to pat it on its head. Billy washed his face and hands and went down to breakfast. The dragon went along. It was bigger now, almost the size of a dog. Billy sat down at the table. The dragon sat down on the table. This sort of thing was not usually permitted, but there wasn't much Billy's mother could do about it. She had already said there was no such thing as a dragon, and if there's no such thing, you can't tell it to get down off the table. And I'll take you back to your childhood real quick, won't it? This is, this is those phrases you heard right here. This is, well, I can stop drinking anytime I want, so we don't need to talk about it. Mom's sick again. She, she, she just can't get out of bed. Don't talk about it. It's not that dad can't keep a job. They, he just keeps finding bad bosses. Don't talk about it. I wouldn't have touched you if you hadn't made me mad. Mother made some pancakes for Billy, but the dragon ate them all. Mother made some more, but the dragon ate those too. Mother kept making pancakes until she ran out of batter. Billy only got one of them, but he said that was all he really wanted anyway. Been there. Billy went upstairs to brush his teeth. Mother started clearing the table. The dragon, who is quite as big as mother by this time, made himself comfortable on the hall rug and went to sleep. By the time Billy came back downstairs, the dragon had grown so much, he filled the hall. Billy had to go around by way of the living room to get to where his mother was. I didn't know dragons grew so fast, said Billy. There's no such thing as a dragon, said mother firmly. Cleaning the downstairs took mother all morning, what with the dragon in the way. Having to climb in and out of windows to get from room to room. Admitting there's a dragon means you have to deal with it. By noon, the dragon filled the house. Its head hung out the front door. Its tail hung out the back door. There wasn't a room in the house that didn't have some part of the dragon in it. When the dragon awoke from its nap, he was hungry. A bakery truck went by. The smell of fresh bread was more than the dragon could resist. The dragon ran down the street after the bakery truck. The house went along, of course, like the shell on a snail. The mailman was just coming up the path with some mail for the Bixby's when their house rushed past him and headed down the street. He chased the Bixby's house for a few blocks, but he couldn't catch it. Other people will notice your dragon. When Mr. Bixby came home for lunch, the first thing he noticed was the house was gone. Luckily, one of the neighbors was able to tell him which way it went. Mr. Bixby got in his car and went looking for the house. He studied all the houses as he drove along. Finally, he saw one that looked familiar. Billy and Mrs. Bixby were waving from an upstairs window. Mr. Bixby climbed over the dragon's head onto the porch roof and through the upstairs window. How did this happen? Mr. Bixby asked. It was the dragon, said Billy. There's no such thing, Mother started to say. There is a dragon, Billy insisted, a very big dragon. And Billy patted the dragon on the head. The dragon wagged its tail happily. Then, even faster than it had grown, the dragon started getting smaller. Soon it was kitten-sized again. I don't mind dragons this size, said Mother. Why did it have to grow so big? I'm not sure, said Billy. I think it just wanted to be noticed. Here's the deal. This journey is about being real. And you're going to face some dragons. But before you face the dragons out there in the world, you've got to deal with the dragons in your own home. Sometimes you slay them, but you have to acknowledge them. Your family has problems simply because your family is full of sinners. And this journey is not about pointing fingers. The question is, what will you do? And this is why we need Jesus. Because there's a dragon out there. And I need to wield truth so I can slay it. And I need to be showered in grace when I fall short. If you've ever tried to face the dragon on your own, and come up short. You need Jesus. You need supernatural help 
to pick you up when you fall down, and supernatural truth to guide you forward. Check the baptism box so you can repent and come home. And if you have given your life to Jesus, he has called you to step in to the brokenness of your family, to be a voice of hope and reconciliation, and face the dragons that live there. Because when you do, that is your vulnerability colliding with the gospel of Jesus. And on the other other side of that is the community, even in your family, that you so desperately long for. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you, and we need you. And God, I thank you that church can be fun, emotive, that we can laugh, that we can make an impact around the world, that we can get in groups that build community, that we can stand on your word that sets us free, and where we can face the dragons that have control in our homes. God, we cannot face these alone. We need your spirit in us and working through us because it will be a long, difficult journey, but we know you'll set us free. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.